Good afternoon, everybody. I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you so much for being here today. Um, my name is John Collins. I'm an affiliate at the Berkman Klein Center. I'm here to do uh, the very short intro, work on a few jokes on a new set that I have got going, and then we can start get started. But just a reminder for everyone, uh, this is being live streamed right now, and it will be recorded for the rest of history. Uh, so just be aware of that. For those who are in the audience or those of you who may be watching at home uh, and you have any questions, you can use the Twitter hashtags CryptoKitties or the Twitter hashtag BKCHarvard or both um, for any questions that you may have. Um, and so with that, I'm going to kick it off uh, and to, to this group. And I want to introduce Alex Shea uh, and uh, Dieter Shirley. Dieter is the co-founder and CTO of CryptoKitties. And Alex Shi, when I said Shea, it's Alex Shi, is the uh, CFO of Axiom Zen. And S.J. Klein, who is a researcher in decentralized systems and a renaissance man about town, uh, will be moderating. <laughs> so thank you guys very much. So it's really great to have you all here. I think we've had a couple of casual CryptoKitties meetups in the Cambridge area. And uh, there's still a lot of latent enthusiasm. Uh, but Axiom Zen didn't start as a blockchain company. So maybe if you could give a, a brief history of how you came to CryptoKitties and what it was like to make that shift. Sure. So um, uh, Axiom Zen was uh, founded by, uh, in part by a man named Roham Garagoslu, who's our CEO. And he was actually working in. Um, venture capital in Silicon Valley. Uh, he was a junior partner at a venture firm. And so his basic job was to go around and find companies that the, the firm could invest in. And what he realized was is that, one, the teams mattered very deeply. Um, and getting the right team was more important than getting the right product because, you know, half the, half the teams pivot anyway. Um, but that also that a team is, you know, the old saying, strong as the weakest link. And so, he would find teams and he'd be like, man, this is a great product and those are two great founders. It's a shame that the guy who happened to be in their dorm room when they came up with the idea is along for the ride um, because I think that that person is probably going to end up being the weak link that keeps this thing from succeeding. And the other thing he noted was that when companies do fail, even if they're great teams, um, you know, even the best team can fail when uh, Google releases a free version of your product a week before you go live, uh, just because of happenstance, and they, they just have to go home. There is no, they don't get a second swing. Uh, sometimes there's a pivot, but you know, more often than not, there's an aqua hire, and then they end up going and working. This great team gets broken up and goes and working for some larger company. And so his, his thesis was, let's just bring together some amazing people, and let's just be a startup that builds startups. And let's not put all of our eggs in any one basket. Let's just keep trying different things and different things and see what works. So um, that was in 2013. He formed the company. And it was completely bootstrapped. It took no external funding. Um, and so the first year was a you know, fair number of partnership products working with um, you know, other startups, uh, other more established companies uh, in order to get some working capital. Um, but within the first 18 months, uh, we had uh, launched our first product called ZenHub, uh, which is still a going concern, doing very well. It's a project management tool that plugs into GitHub. We built it for ourselves, um, and now folks like IBM and Walmart are using it. Uh, we then launched a company called Rautific that went through the Techstars program and now has spun out and has taken external funding. And, and so the model was working. And so in last... Last summer, uh, 2017, um, we decided that blockchain, which we'd been interested in for years, me personally, since before Axiom Zen started, but Axiom Zen since the beginning, uh, was always dabbling in crypto technology. Um, but last year we decided it was time to consider making a business out of it. And, uh, you know, we launched CryptoKitties and we did all right. <laughs> I mean, it's hard to argue. Kittens. On the blockchain, <laughs> right? That that alone is pretty great. But blockchains are decentralized, slow, annoying to update compared to traditional systems that you were building for. Uh, what kinds of affordances did you need to make when you were planning out what what this would look like? 
Well, I, I think the most difficult thing for us is that, you know, as a startup who builds startups and, you know, who are, you know, big fans of the lean startup methodology and agile and, you know, this move fast and break things, the smart contracts we couldn't do that with. So, you know, the typical mantra is you ship something even if it's terrible and, and then you refine it. But you can't ship a terrible smart contract and refine it. Part of the, part of the nature of smart contracts is, is that there are, are limits on what you can change. And part of the appeal of blockchain-based apps is that your users can count on you not making changes to certain things. And so we had to put a lot more time, effort, and you know, code review juice into the smart contracts. Uh, we still sh shipped a terrible first version of the front end and all of that stuff, and have been iterating it and making it better the whole time. Um, but that was a that was a that was a very big difference. So uh, stepping back for a second, I own a couple of crypto kitties, which I guess means that I own a couple 256 bit numbers mm -hmm. uh, that happen to be interpreted by your code. Mm -hmm. How many people here have never seen or played with a CryptoKitty? Okay, so for, for everyone who hasn't, who hasn't worked with them yet, <laughs> what is it like? What, what are the CryptoKitties? Uh, it, it, there's a sense in which they, they act like other creatures you might raise. You can breed them. You can, um, you can exchange breeding cats with other friends or people in your network. Uh, but say a little bit more about what it means to have a crypto kitty and how people currently interact with them. So the the basics of the game is is that each cat is has its own 256 bit genome and it has a uh, physical appearance that's derived from that. So it might have you know these various different types of eyes and colors and all these things and those the visual appearance of a cat is is uh, derived from its genes. But its genes have its more information in it than it is expressed. And so when you breed two cats together, um, which is the cool part of the game, uh, you get a new cat and it takes, it, its genome is derived from it, both of its parents. Um, and so it might look like, it might have its mother's eyes uh, and its uh, father's uh, tail, um, but it might actually have some sort of uh, hidden recessive gene uh, or there may even be a mutation and all that is mediated by a bit of randomness. And so the game is, well, what cool combinations can you make? Um, you might think that a black cat with red stripes looks really cool and so you want to go find a striped pea cat and a red cat and a black cat and breed them together until you get with one that's, got, that's black with red stripes. Um, the reason blockchain is interesting is because our smart contract, which, as I alluded to earlier, uh, once we've deployed it, we we have very, we have we have given ourselves limitations on what we can change about it, and we don't have an override key to change it once we've released it. That smart contract handles all of the ownership, and so if you own your cat, we can't take it from you. Um, and it handles the genetics, so there's no way even for us to manipulate the genetics of your cat once it's been born. And it handles the genetic combination, and so that algorithm that takes the two parents and mixes their genes together to create the kitten is, again, something that we have no ability to modify, manipulate. Um, and it, it's easily verifiable for users, well, for technical users, um, that 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 uh, genetic combination algorithm works the same for everybody. There's no code in there that says, oh, if you are this user, then combine it in this way. And if you're not in this special class of user, then you can combine it in this other way. And so it, it gives very, very strong guarantees to our player base um, that we're not up to any jiggery pokery. And maybe if we take a step back and, and think about a little bit why it's important. The line of discourse we spend a lot of time thinking and talking about, but a token economy in a lot of ways is this new joint venture or partnership that the developers of the platform have put together, but the community is going to participate in, and they're going to be an owner and, and, and have a lot of control of kind of what goes on there. And so what really kind of happens, particularly with the consumer-facing piece of the business, 
is we're crystallizing that cultural value and, and kind of representing it with these liquid tokens. And so I think the combination of the excitement and some of the, the noise and fanfare that happened just with the launch of this product, but also the product itself, that it's this cute kitten, hopefully you guys all think it's cute, um, and people actually really like that, kind of creates this awesome product that as a consumer that you own, it's, it's truly yours, and I think that's something that's really cool. So late last year, you launched <coughs> the first version of your interface. You got a bunch of, a bunch of people playing with CryptoKitties. Soon after, I picked up a couple of CryptoKitties. Uh, the kitties broke Ethereum. <laughs> you chose, you implemented your, this game on top of Ethereum. Uh, and at some point in December, well over a quarter of all transactions on, the on that blockchain were calls to one of your contracts. Uh, and the price of gas on Ether, the, the intermediate um, fuel that, that runs all contracts went up by 100 fold. How, how did you deal with that? What, what things were you able to do in response and what things did you wish you could have done? The, the number of users we got in our first week exceeded anybody's expectations. Um, and so, I mean, it, it was really easy to see that that the Ethereum network was was saturated, um, and and you know, I mean, technically it was functioning as design, and it was still processing transactions, so it wasn't broken. Um, but from the user standpoint, it was terribly broken because there was very little visibility into why your transactions weren't working, and when your transactions weren't being processed by the network, um, it would stall your whole account. Um, the transactions in Ethereum have to be processed in order, so even if you put a new transaction in, we're willing to pay a higher transaction fee, that old one would, would block you from, from getting processed. Um, what most people don't realize is that our own infrastructure was burning at the same time, so what we actually did was panic because our own databases weren't ready for that kind of scale, our front end was falling apart, um, and, you know, and, and we run uh, our own Ethereum nodes and they were, they were breaking as well. So that was a very exciting time. Um, for the most part, we weren't able to do a ton, and that's the you know that's the the double-edged sword of a decentralized system. We don't own that infrastructure. We don't have to maintain that infrastructure, but it also means that there are great limits on what we can do to enhance that infrastructure. Um, and you know the the way it's architected and the, the nature of decentralized systems, especially the way that Ethereum approaches it, means that there are you can't just like a switch and say, okay, well, we're going to increase our capacity by twice as much. Um, and believe me, there were lots of people that were asking for people to, asking the network to do exactly that. And, and um, the, uh, the, the sort of, I, I guess, it, it, decentralized systems are odd because there's no one in charge, but there are people that have influence. So Vitalik uh, Buterin was the, the, one of the co-founders of uh, Ethereum, sort of the is sort of the spiritual father of the whole uh, Ethereum um, movement. And, you know, certain things are outside of his control, but he ha has a lot of influence. And so um, he basically said, no, we're not going to do that because that'll make the network weaker in the long run. But um, there wasn't a ton we could do. We, we did a little bit of work to try and make it so that our users would have a better experience. And um, we would, uh, we built a system so that we could filter or we could hold people's transactions so that if, it seemed like the network was too busy to process their transactions. At least we would hold it so that they could cancel it, because there's there's no good way to cancel a transaction once it's been released to the to the peer-to-peer -peer network. Um, and so at least then they could cancel transactions that weren't going through, as opposed to just having them, you know, in this weird um, uh, purgatory state where they weren't being processed, but they couldn't really be canceled either. Taking a step back again. Uh, to the mechanisms of owning and, and breeding cats. Uh, tell me a little bit about birthing and birth demons. You designed a system so that one of the most complicated parts of the network was something that anyone could call or that anyone could, could help process. And, uh, and that's also one of the places where you maintain a little bit of leverage over how the, how the whole uh, kittyverse works, mm. in that you can change how much it costs to run the birthing contract. Mm -hmm. So, how do you think about how do you think about those mechanics and uh, the the part about the you know, ether chain being set on fire that I remember was that the cost of birthing went up 
sevenfold. And uh, that made a big difference in how, in how people interacted with the game. Mm -hmm. So um, just as some background to that question, the, um, the theory of network, you have to pay for the amount of computation that needs to be done. And the most expensive uh, computation that we do in the CryptoKitties universe is that genetic combination where you take the genes from the two parents and uh, combine them with a bit of uh, random entropy and, and produce the genes for the offspring. And the, because it's a game um, and it's part of what makes things fun is anticipation, we have a time delay between the point at which the user decides to breed their cats and when, when the, the child um, is born. And so we determine what the genes of the child are at that birthing time. And so the user needs to initiate the, the, the breeding. And then somebody sometime needs to call a give birth, fun give birth function. Um, and that function is very expensive. And so we needed a mechanism to, um, to incentivize people to do this because we didn't want to have to, uh, we didn't want to have to count on ourselves to, to make that happen. Um, and so we do have a, a, a background demon that runs and will give birth to kittens if, if no one else does. But we wanted to have, you know, sort of the decentralized idea is, is that you don't have any single central point of failure that, that could fail and, and mean that no cats could be born. And so we made it so that anyone could call that function. And in particular, we incentivize people. And so the, when you breed your cats, you pay a fee called the birthing fee. And that fee is held in escrow, and then when the give birth function is called, that fee is given to the person, whoever calls the give birth function. And so the person who calls give birth has to pay the transaction fee um, to do all this computation, but they get as a reward this birthing fee. And so when we originally set the birthing fee, the gas prices were very low, the cost of the birthing transaction was relatively low, and so we, we set the birthing fee quite low. Um, and it quickly became apparent that it wasn't enough to cover the cost of actually calling give birth, um, and so we increased it. <coughs> and then, then the network blew up, and the, the cost of gas went up even higher, and no one was calling it, and we didn't want to raise it again on our users. We were, we just launched this product a week ago. We didn't want to upset our users by increasing the, the fee to them, and so we started eating that cost of, of calling give birth, and we actually... It was on the order of 100 Ether that we spent one weekend. Uh, ether was cheaper then, but it was, I don't know, anyone who wants to do the math can realize that this guy is a CFO. He was very unhappy about that. But um, <coughs> in order to give people a good experience, we actually ate that cost for a little while. Um, right now, it's actually, the birthing fee is actually quite a bit higher than, than what most, what needs to be paid. Um, but we actually keep it at that level because, one, the gas prices fluctuate, and so it can you know, it's conceivable that the gas price will go up again. And we don't want our users to have to constantly be thinking about what the birthing fee is. Um, the other thing is, is that... It's a good business model right now to be a midwife. It's a, it's a, it's a remarkably good business model. Actually, um, one of my guests today here is Dr. Michael Zargum over there. Um, and he runs a team called Block Science. And they're, they're doing some formalization around blockchain-based economic systems. Um, and working together on some actually non-CryptoKitties related stuff, but he and his team independently have been analyzing CryptoKitties because it's one of the few examples of non-speculative activity on a blockchain. Um, and uh, the, they've built some interesting models around the, the behavior of the people who are calling the, the give birth. Uh, and it's a, it's a minor industry. Like these people have written custom code and they have these demons and they have, they have you know, heuristics in place to figure out exactly how much you know, how much, how much gas they should be willing to pay because if two of them go to give birth and one succeeds and the other one fails, they both have to pay the transaction cost, but only one gets refunded. And so then they have to like play this game of chicken where maybe they'll overpay the transaction cost because then they're more likely to get processed first, but then they lose more if they don't. And it's, it's a really fascinating um, bit of game theory happening there. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's one of those crazy things where it, it seemed like a really simple and elegant idea and this, like, all this complex, chaotic behavior is sort of, you know, uh, swirling away off the wingtip. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's a very, very interesting aspect. And maybe just with respect, with respect to the volatility, I think it's certainly interesting. There's this relatively benign game that, that caused a little bit of ruckus. 
um, as Dieter alluded to, there are certainly influencers around Ethereum particularly, and they're all benevolent generally. Um, but there's actually quite a concentrated mining pool, and there's this idea that all these miners are economically aligned in these kind of things and that we'll always have good actors, but we haven't really seen what happens if somebody is not perfectly rational. We know from behavioral economics that you know, we're not all perfectly rational human beings, or what if somebody actually is a benevolent actor uh, and they actually want to actually create some more volatility or other things. So when these systems are under stress and, and um, under attack in some form, I think there, it'll be an interesting topic to monitor and think about. So luckily, uh, some of the commodities futures groups are reasonably rational, and there seems to be agreement, at least in North America, that CryptoKitties are not a security. Uh, can you say a little bit about what, is, what it was like in December and January talking to regulators about this? Uh, sure. Uh, and Dieter will jump in and, and be able to provide some more color as well. But we spent a lot of time with the British Columbia Securities Commission talking through exactly what these are. And I think a lot of the regulatory authorities look at all of these different tokens that are coming out and saying, well, is it security? Is it a commodity? Is it real estate? Is it currency? It's all unclear. And so they asked a bunch of questions around, well, how many tokens or kitties can there be? Uh, and in concept, there can be infinite if everybody in this room wants to breed their kitties into perpetuity. Uh, or what is the creation event? Um, and again, that's not under our control, right? That's under the community's control. Uh, and so we spent a lot of cycles going back and forth with them and trying to say, okay, this, you know, is not a function that looks or acts in any way like a security, um, but took a quite a long time to get us there. Yeah, it was, it was really interesting because it was clear that the the regulators were were just coming to terms with the sort of predominant model of ICOs, right? So you go and you create some fixed supply of tokens and you sell a bunch of them and you use that money to build a network that is powered by those tokens and the theory being that those tokens will increase in value as that network gets used uh, and are a good proxy for the value of that network. And so you're investing in the network instead of the company. And, and so the, you know, tons of ICOs and, and of course the regulators are talking to these teams and all of these teams are trying to make the argument that the thing that, that they're using to raise money to build a network that's going to make the investors rich isn't in a security. Um, and so they're trying to explain all of these things and, and making statements that w would be simply untrue. So the security, the regulator would come to me and say, well, what's the hard cap on the number of tokens you have? I'm like, well, first of all, we call them kitties. Um, and second of all, there is no hard cap. Like people can just keep breeding them, and they're like, no, but there has to be a hard cap. Like there is every every ICO has to have a hard cap, and I'm like, I'm sorry, dude, but people are lying to you. Like there is no reason for there to be a hard cap unless you want price appreciation. So um, yeah, it's it was it was really interesting, and it was clear to see that how difficult it is from somebody in that position to get accurate information because all the people they're talking to. Uh, clearly have <laughs> a particular uh, side of the axe they want to grind. So, so in, this, in the notion of inside your ecosystem, the Kittyverse, there, you have your own questions of governance and policy formation. What sorts of um, internal governance have you seen develop? And what are some sorts of, what are exploits that you've had to combat? So the, I would say the biggest question with our product, our system, our thing, is that the question of what, what is decentralized, how decentralized are we, are we decentralized enough? Um, and so this, the idea of decentralized is that, that there's no single person or no, no small group of people who are in control. Um, and we absolutely are in control of parts of CryptoKitties. Um, so the things I said earlier about ownership and the genetics of cats and the genetic combination being outside our control is 100% true. But it's not a very good game if we just released a, a bunch of trait combinations and let people breed them. That wouldn't have any longevity. It would, it would be a, a pretty short experience. And so we made the decision early on that we would, we would release um, about a third of the traits on day one and then over the course of a year release more traits. And so, you know, every day new, uh, new eyes and body shapes and patterns are coming out. Um, not every day, every week. And, and that, 
brings some freshness to the game, and it, it means that people, you know, every week have something new to, to try and get, get a hold of, and, and there's a whole, you know, they're collectors, right? Their players are, are fundamentally collectors, and they, they want to catch them all. And we, that just simply would have been impossible in a fully decentralized way with the infrastructure that we have now. Um, the other big thing that, that uh, people have complained about is, is that we store the art for the cat. So um, theoretically, we could change the art for a cat after it, after it had been born, because we don't store the art in the blockchain, because the blockchain does not have an efficient way. So uh, Ethereum in particular, storing the art in, in Ethereum would have been very expensive. Uh, there are systems, uh, most notably one called IPFS, that lets you store data in a decentralized fashion that is um, uh, resistant to tampering. Um, and we could store a reference to an IPFS, to IPFS data in the smart contract. And so people would have very strong guarantees that the, the data for their cat couldn't be tampered with. The problem is that IPFS is a very very nascent project. It's it's not especially robust yet, and so we decided when we launched that we wouldn't that we wouldn't want to depend on on such such new technology. It was bad enough depending on Ethereum, which was which was more mature, but still, um, as we saw, you know, not ready for prime time in some ways. Um, but you know, what's funny is is that even something as simple as a, a pause button. So you know, you know, it talked about how you usually you move fast and break things but with the knowledge that you can fix them. And because we were releasing this smart contract and we weren't sure if there would be any sort of contract level exploits, we wanted to put in a pause button so that we could, in the worst case, you know, at the very least, we could keep whatever bad behavior was happening from continuing to happen uh, while we figured out how to address it. And so we have a special function we can call and it requires a, a special key that's kept very securely, cryptographic key that's kept very securely. Um, but it can pause the whole contract. And some of our users, believe it or not, won't play the game, or potential users won't play the game because they, they feel like that's too much control for us to have. Um, even though it's an action we've never taken and you know it's not rational for us to take that action, the fact that we have that key and that we can ruin the experience for everyone else um, if we chose to, is is enough to keep certain people uh, away. So decentralization is is really important to to certain people. But have you had any instances of catnapping or people <laughs> trying to hack your exchange? Like you run a very nice, clean, beautiful exchange, but you've made it possible for anyone to run their own exchange. Mm -hmm. uh, have people like what are some ways that people have tried creatively to? take advantage of the systems that exist? So there's certainly been scammers who have, you know, promised, oh, I, you know, I'll give you a free cat, just send me your private key and I, so I can send it to you, um, and then had their cat stolen from them. Um, uh, we, we've had, I mean, actually what's most amazing to me is, is how, how much more irrational but benevolent behavior we've seen. So there are, you know, one you know simple example is Kitties for Cause, which is uh, um, accepts donations of cats and then auctions those cats and gives the proceeds to Seattle Children's Hospital. Um, there, uh, another one of our community members started a, a kitty orphanage where anybody who wanted to could donate the cats to the kitty orphanage, and then um, anybody who was starting the game could ask for cats, and then the person who ran the orphanage would pay the transfer fees. Uh, out of their own pocket uh, to get somebody started with the game, um, and you know it was, it's not uncommon in our uh, in our chat group to see people be like, "Oh, I'm getting new to this game. How do I get started?" And people are like, "Well, send me your address, and I'll send you some cats." So, um, so there's there's a ton of benevolent behavior. Um, the the behavior that is outside of what a normal user would be expected to do. But it's hard to call it malevolent is the scripters. So people will write automated scripts that interact directly with our smart contract and will do things like, you know, scan the genome, decode it, and see when we release a new cat, see if we're releasing a new trait, and if we are releasing a new trait, buy that cat before anybody else can. 
before it even shows up on the website because their website reflects the on-chain, what's happening on-chain, and there's a delay for that to happen. Whereas if you are looking at the chain directly, you can, you can act very quickly. Um, people also will set up, um, either manually or through scripting, will set up uh, breeding farms where you know, certain, certain genetic combinations lead to what we call fancy cats, which have uh, unique art. Um, so uh, we have some stickers actually uh, later. Uh, you'll be able to see some of those. But we have a dragon and Dracula cat and Flutter Bee, which is this beautiful cat with uh, butterfly wings. Um, so they'll breeding those cats is, is is highly coveted, and so people will write scripts where they'll they'll just automate that breeding process, and they can just they'll breed thousands of times, um, and to to generate these uh, these rare fancy cats. Um, and it's, it's, I think it's frustrating for some users who don't want to, who like feel like they should just use the web interface. Um, but at the end of the day, it's, they're not breaking the rules of the game. They're just playing it in a very different way. So um, what we're trying to do to address that is just to make sure that we have a variety of different, in the case of Fancy Cats, uh, options so that some of them are easier to breed, some of them are harder to breed, some of them will be more amenable for players who've been playing a long time, some of them will be easier for people who have scripts to do it, but hopefully there'll be enough variety so that everyone sort of has a chance. If everyone starts uh, sharing their favorite collectibles or their favorite items and moving more of their property registries onto things like a blockchain, uh, one of the side effects is that a lot of people can read the chains and figure out a lot about each particular person, each particular character. Uh, what do you see as the implications in all of that for privacy of your players? And uh, what are some things that, what are some ways to address that in designing, for someone who's designing new systems? That's, uh, that's a big question. I don't know that, <laughs> certainly that second part, uh, I don't know that I have any great insights, but I think it's certainly an interesting line of thought that I think we should all be thinking about, that privacy is something that's obviously top of mind for a lot of people. There's been a lot of press recently about uh, what information about you is out there and who has and that kind of thing. And I think this can be a seismic land shift and just kind of the information that's available out there. And if you kind of play this out to the extreme, that all the information about you can be recorded and, and put in some way and so somebody can access it. Um, there's this great quote that uh, Dieter was on a panel for that, that we should talk about. Um, but I, I think we'll have to really rethink kind of what privacy means um, and how we all interact in that kind of world. Yeah, but, so the, the privacy angle is fascinating to me because some of our users, of course, are, are old hands at Ethereum and they, they create different addresses for each experience that they that they do. So if they're going to go and trade, you know, whatever Aragon or whatever tokens, they go and they have one account for that, and then they have a different account for CryptoKitties. Um, but other users are just, you know, they use it the way you would use a credit card or something like that, where you just like you don't think about having a different credit card for different websites. You just use the same address and all the things. Um, and because of the nature of the blockchain, we can literally, if if we choose, go and look at our users and say, well. How much money do they have? What other things are they doing on Ethereum? How long, you know, obviously we know how long they've been playing the game, but we can, we can see things outside of our own game, which is a, which is a very unusual kind of um, power to have. Uh, I, I, it's, it's tough. I mean, the thing that Alex was alluding to was um, I, I saw uh, Albert Wenger from uh, USV speaking, Albert. Um, Wangers from USB speaking in, in Berlin, and, and he was talking about how he is starting to believe that privacy is not the thing that we are trying to protect with privacy. The thing we're trying to the things we're trying to protect are freedom of thought and freedom from persecution, and that privacy is just the way that we have have protected those two things. And if we can protect those two things by other means, then, then privacy actually isn't that interesting. Um, and in fact, if we can find a way to protect those other two things, which he does consider valuable and, and basic human rights, um, that, that 
privacy is actually more trouble than it's worth, especially as we um, build more and more powerful technologies. And you can imagine someone, you know, printing an automatic weapon in their basement. Um, you know, he feels that he, he basically says, "Look, it, we have the right as a society to know what happens in basements if ba basements let you build um, uh, uh, automatic assault rifles." And so it's it's a really interesting question. I I, I don't fully accept his his argument as yet. Um, but it is very compelling because when you think of all the reasons why you want privacy, it does boil down to those two other things, at least all the examples I've thought of. And, and so the question then becomes, well, okay, fine, let's say you're right and that is true. How do we protect those things without privacy? Because it's, it's just too easy to imagine, um, you know, like, okay, so I have freedom from persecution. Well, you know, if, if my employer can see what sport teams I like and, and, you know, he's a huge Raiders fan and I'm not, like, can I, like, how do you protect against that kind of persecution? Um, so it's a, I don't know, I, I think it's a really difficult question, but we're certainly starting to see it where, you know, one of the things that comes up a lot in, um, in blockchain context is this thing called a Sybil attack, and that's the idea where one person can pose as two people. And there's no real way to detect that the, the two actors that you're seeing interacting with you are actually one, one person. And more particularly, it's so cheap to create these addresses that it could be a thousand actors, um, and you can't tell if there's, if there's a single person behind it. And the number of times that that issue comes up is, is remarkable. Um, we talked the other day about, oh, wouldn't it be cool if we had a contest where we gave away, you know, free cat every week? Oh, that's great. How do we know that people aren't entering the contest a thousand times by creating a thousand addresses? Um, you know, uh, I've seen people talk about uh, building blockchain-based UBI systems. Well, you know, like that, that's uh, very, very ripe for a UBI attack, or sorry, a civil attack. Um, so, you know, in the blockchain world, ironically, a civil attack is the defense against having your privacy uh, violated. The way that we don't know what other blockchain games you're playing is because you're using different addresses and different experiences. And while at the same time that that civil attack has has problems in all sorts of different um, uh, blockchain or contexts where you know it's so easy to imagine. Oh, we'll just we'll just give each user a free cat, or we'll just, you know, you keep saying these things, we'll give each user, but we don't have a concept of each user in the blockchain. It's, it's, uh, it's, really, it's really remarkable. But I think controlling that access to information is the important part, and I think even in the world we live in today, people don't really know, you know what information is out there and who can access it and that kind of thing, and so to me this is a big, big issue that, that we all need to think a lot about. I want to open it to questions from the audience. Uh, yes, and I think we have, we'll have a couple roving mics. Yeah. Uh, but while we're doing that, just one other question for you, Alex. Sure. Uh, one of the nice things about blockchains is that they've enabled this really fast capitalization of ideas. Sure. As soon as there's an idea and you have people interested in it, there's there's a natural way for them to support the process. Right. CryptoKitties is still one of the few instances of this that didn't involve creating a token. Right. Um, what do you see as the, the general opportunities for all sorts of projects to do something similar? Uh, I think certainly if, if you're showing the token that the capital formation opportunity is, is unprecedented in my mind, that we haven't really seen this speed and size of capital formed around ideas on the basis of where the projects are and, and the amounts they've raised. Governance around these is a, is a super interesting question. So we alluded earlier to each of these token economies is this partnership, but as a consumer user, I think your main stick, so to speak, is just saying, I don't want to use that token. I don't want to be a part of that economy anymore. But we don't really know what happens if somebody has taken all this money in and they don't finish building the product and they just say, okay, this is it, or they don't ship what they say they're going to ship. Um, or they just do something and you're not exactly sure what's going on. Um, and, and so I think there are some projects out there that you could say, wow, that is kind of interesting and 
feel kind of weird, and there's not that much you can do about it today. Um, so in your case, you built a product first. People weren't taking a token in some future event. Right. The, the equivalent was allowing people to start playing with a thing uh, that you made. Do you, see, do you see that kind of practice happening in other, in other spaces, outside of, in other games or outside of games? I think we have seen more of that. There are people who are going the more traditional venture route to kind of build the product first. I think that is a kind of step in the right direction, certainly. Um, and, and I do think we will see more of that. I think there, uh, we'll see kind of how the token offerings kind of continue from this point forward, but uh, it will be an evolving picture, I'm sure. Hey, for those of us, maybe I'm the only one in the room who's never played with blockchain or Ethereum, but you, you use some concepts that I don't quite know what they are. You talked about gas. You talked about gas prices. There's some sort of interaction between you know, the dollar economy and the economy of your game. And I, try, I sort of want to understand how that works. Also, why can't you, also, why do I have to pay to run this function where I, if I could just run it on my own computer? Uh, th those, are, those are great questions. Um, and I apologize for not covering that earlier. So uh, gas is, the notion of gas comes up a lot in the concept of Ethereum, but um, that's, that's more sort of an implementation detail. And I think the important thing to understand is, is that there is a transaction fee. So gas is how the transaction fee is computed, but at the end of the day, the, the important thing to understand is that there's a transaction fee. Um, and the reason why you want to pay this transaction fee and have the computation done by this network is because the, the, once the computation is done in the network, the, the fact that the computation was done and done correctly is, is locked into the blockchain and is, is securely uh, attestable by anybody. And so if I say I have a cat that has, um, you know, uh, googly eyes, um, how, do you, how do you know to believe me? And the way you know that is you go and look at the blockchain and you see either the data that's stored that says my cat has googly eyes, or you can go back and find the function call that created that cat and see that that was executed correctly um, and, and you know, if you actually run an Ethereum node, it will, it will replay all of the computations and verify every single one of them. And so that's, that's, the, that's the value, is, is that every computation done in the network is, is, um, is recorded for all time in a, in a very secure and uh, tamper-proof manner, and uh, is, it is very easy to check that it was done correctly. Hi, um, Chris Dixon famously said all the cool advances start out looking like toys. And you've got the world's greatest investors coming in. I know it's crypto case isn't spun off. But I got a sense that the people are not just looking at your promise, the, great, the big picture out there of creating another game and being like a Rovio. Maybe it is. But could you talk about some of your thoughts about 721 tokens or you know, where it's going? in relates to CryptoKitties. If you are now the masters of the personal, non-fungible property, where will this take CryptoKitties? Or crypto banks, or crypto, whatever you are going to make. Are you staying just focused on games because you know, that's a consumer behavior, or is there something else? So, I mean, right now, we've got what no one else has, which is users. Um, <laughs> Everybody else has investors, um, speculators, um, advocates, but we have people who are actually using our thing, which is, which is kind of cool. Uh, and so the, the most important thing for us is to, is to make sure that we're serving those users and growing the number of users. And all of our users right now are gamers, and they're playing a game. And we want to make that a better game. <laughs> Doug, there you go. Um, but it, 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 I mean, people who play, I mean, the term gamer is, is interesting because, you know, do people who, you know, who play uh, Candy Crush at the DMV, are they gamers? Well, you know, by one definition, I think they are, uh, even though that's certainly not the way that they would identify themselves. But, um, you know, uh, the, the, the audience we have, the users we have, in, they engage in because it's a game, and we just want to make the game bigger and better. Um, one of the things that kind of blew our minds after we launched was there was this team that created a, a product called Kitty Hats. 
um, and it's, uh, it's closed for your cats. And they created their own smart contract, they created their own web front end, and they sell tokens that are independent from our tokens that represent hats, sunglasses, shoes, entire outfits. And you can give the token to your cat, and then the cat owns the hat. This blows my mind. And so it's, you own the cat, but the cat owns the hat. And so if you sell the cat, the hat goes with it. And the amazing thing about this is that they built this without permission. They built this without us having any special API access or anything like that. Everything that they needed was things that we already had to do in order to build a smart contract. And everything we needed to do in order to make sure that somebody building on top of our product didn't break our product, we already had to do because of the nature of smart contracts. And so without any added work, we've got this massively extensible environment. There's, there's a team that's doing kitty races now where you race your cats um, uh, around a little track. And you know, there's, there's multiple teams working on kitty battles, obviously inspired by Pokemon. And I, I, it's really amazing to me this idea that we can build an experience and other people can build stuff on top of it. And it's this incredible win-win-win where they're able to build a product that has a revenue model that gives our users new toys and ways to use their cats, which makes our own ecosystem more valuable. Um, all of which doesn't require any special permission or, or, and I think just as importantly, that we can't stop. Like, we can't keep people from doing this. Um, I mean, we wouldn't want to, but the, the knowledge that we can't stop them is one of the reasons why they feel comfortable doing it, right? Twitter very famously cut off um, third-party clients uh, at one point in its history, and most people thought that that was irrational and, and was hurting the company, and I think it could be argued they were right. Um, but they did it, and there was nothing those third parties could do, but we can't ever cut people off from building experiences on top of CryptoKitties. Indeed, we could shut our whole company down tomorrow, and not, our players could keep playing CryptoKitties, and our players could keep putting hats on them. And to me, I think that's really just saying, from a digital collectibles point, we're, we're really just scratching the surface. We're still just figuring out what all that means. Our belief is gaming is a great way to kind of build public knowledge and get consumers comfortable with this technology. So I don't know anything about your daughter, but she had to go through the process, get Ethereum, buy the cat, figure out how a smart contract works, all these things. Um, and also kind of change how you think about it. So a lot of people, I think, who play the game think about the cats in terms of Ethereum. They don't say, oh, wow, this cost me $500 or whatever it is. They're getting more comfortable with uh, interacting in that ecosystem, and then we can really start to unleash the power of uh, networks. Um, so there's like a two-part question. Um, so I, I spent my birthday buying crypto kitties, and it was a lot of fun. Um, when I was about to breed a kitties, um, there was like no gender. So was that a conscious decision? Uh, um, and then what do you think about cats, the, the interoperability of cats? So let's say like I could, if I could send my cat to like a dragon, and now the dragon eats the cat, and it becomes a stronger dragon cat or something. <laughs> Um, I don't know what you mean by that second point. Like, would we create an experience like that, or would somebody else? Yeah, yeah. Would, you, would you create an experience like that, where, where you just basically you're adding on top of the cat? Would you ever create like, a like another animal where the cat is being like? Subsumed by right? right? Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, I, the last thing we'd want to do is to, is to create an experience that, that to our players doesn't feel like it fits in with CryptoKitties. Um, and so, you know, we've talked a little bit about, well, it might be cool to have, like, if you were to do kitty battles, maybe the cats get into robots to, to do the fight instead of just fighting Pokemon style. Um, but I, 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 don't, I don't really like the idea of the cats being eaten, so it's <laughs> unlikely that we'll do anything like that. Opt-in upgrade that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, the, uh, the gender issue was absolutely a conscious decision. Uh, the original thought was is that the cats would, would have a gender at birth. Um, and I just, I'll be honest, I just thought that the world was ready. <laughs> um, and, you know, I, I think it makes it a better game because you don't have this one less variable that you have to worry about. But I also just think that it, it, it makes a, uh, an important statement that, that maybe we think about gender a little too much. And, 
So yeah, so every, every time you breed your cats, one is a matron and one is a sire, but uh, there's no reason why the next, next time your matron couldn't sire and your sire couldn't matron. So. Um, thanks for coming. Y'all are the highlight of finals week. Um, so I saw yesterday the uh, Steph Curry branded Crypto Kitty. And I'm wondering how, as you guys start to launch into partnerships, you're going to deal with the fact that independent users can, say, create their own branded clothing already without any financial integration with your model, and whether that's going to cannibalize the whole partnerships model. So we're working right now with a legal team to try and, and create a legal structure that maps the way that we and, and our users think about the ownership of the cats. Um, so we hold the copyright for all of the art, and we kind of need to because if we were to release that copyright, then anybody else could create a, a whole game that would compete with us using, using our own art assets against us. On the other hand, you know, the, this idea of ownership is important and intrinsic to CryptoKitties, and we want people who own their cats to feel like they own their cats. Now, what most people don't think about, but I, I imagine if they did, they sort of realize it, is that there's no law against making your own Crypto Kitty T-shirt, or, or even a Steph Curry T-shirt, or a Mr. T T-shirt, right? Like you can, for your own personal use, you can create any sort of likeness you want. It's only when you start to sell it and make money on it that it's a problem. But when you think about what our users want to do, more often than not, they don't want to make their own stuffy. They want to go to a service provider and say, "Please make a stuffy of my cat." And we absolutely want to allow that. And so the license that we're trying to create is a license whereby service providers can say are given a license to use our art and our assets and to create derivative works of our copyrighted materials, provided that they are doing that, the, the, work, the derivative work they are creating is for a person who owns the asset that they're, that they're creating. So that's a very complicated way of saying that if you go to a t-shirt company and you prove that you own the cat with blue stripes, then they're allowed to print you a t-shirt that has a cat with blue stripes on it. But if you ask for a t-shirt with a cat with red stripes, they're like, no, can't do, because we legally can't do that. Um, and that's the world that, we, that we're trying to create. And, and so in a similar way to the way that the, the GPL, the GNU Public License, built this idea of open source or free software on top of copyright, we want to build this idea of, of the ownership of digital assets on top of copyright as well. But those barriers are important. I think you're hitting on uh, an important point around the permissionless part of it, right? So if Kitty Hats did a partnership with Ralph Lauren and they made you know, a whole series of Ralph Lauren clothes for kitties, that's outside of our purview. That's something that they could do and, and they could build. And so I think each person who's interacting with that ecosystem needs to figure out kind of where are their boundaries and what do they control and what do they protect, so. Uh, yeah. um, so I have two questions. One is, um, Theoretically, it would be possible for anyone to actually create a new front end and uh, be such that the same exact token, which is illustrated as a crypto kitty in your website, will be illustrated as a crypto puppy or whatever else on another website. And you could have a variety of uh, representation of that same digital asset, right? Um, and my question being here is, why is it that no one has, has done that already, right? Like you can leverage the exact same technology with, without even creating another smart contract, but just having different metrics by which you can interpret the meaning of this, uh, this quote, right? Um, and the other question is, I think like one beyond uh, digital collectible, I think another really interesting thing uh, of a blockchain-based token is using it as an actual uh, li licensing device. And then could you not... Uh, in, with, the, with the question of copyright, could you not actually say that when I own the crypto kitty, I don't only just own this this little token on the smart contract, but this token on the smart contract also represent the actual ownership or the licensing for that particular user that owns the token to be able to use that particular uh, images that is on the website in various ways. And in that case, when I transfer the, the crypto kitty, I'm also transferring the copyright that comes with it. So first, the first question is, is that I think the reason no one's uh, copied, uh, created a new front end with the different art for the same uh, genetics is because there's, there's no business model there. There's no way to make money doing that. Um, 
and there are dozens of, of teams that are creating their own smart contracts in their own front end. But if you're going to go to all the trouble to create the art and to create the, um, you know, it, the, well, basically the art and then, and then the front end, um, why not go the little extra mile and create the back end so that they're so that you have the to you're the one selling the tokens in the first place. So um, the business model of ours is that um, any any when we create new cats. So so I said we release new genetics, and the way we release new genetics is that we create these new cats that we call generation zero cats or gen zeros, and those cats have traits in them. Um, that are released by us. And the only way for new genetic material to get out into the, the population is through these Gen Zero cats. And so we release those on a, on a regular basis, and anyone who wants to can come and buy one. We use a, 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 an auction mechanism, a, 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 downward, a descending clock auction or Dutch auction. Um, and, uh, and so that, that price is set automatically. So that's, that's where we get the lion's share of our money. And so somebody creating a dog thing on top of that, they would, they would just make us more money, which is fine, I guess. I don't know why they would do that, though. Um, but loads of people have copied it. There's, there's lots of different people who are doing their own smart contracts. Um, I'm sure some of them have, have borrowed our code as well. Um, the, the question about the license, the, the idea of the, um, the crypto asset being a license itself is, is fine. The question that we haven't resolved to ourselves is what rights do we want to give owners of the art? Because well, the last thing that we want to do is, is make it easy for someone to use the art against us. Um, and so if someone wants to go and make a t-shirt for themselves, that's great. Please do that, right? If you want to make your own stickers of your own cat or mug, or um, that I, we definitely want to do that. On the other hand, if you're going to take one of our cats and put it on t-shirts and sell that in stores, that's a different thing entirely. Um, now you're not doing a thing for yourself. You are uh, making money off of our IP. Um, and the people who are buying that t-shirt don't own that cat. And so what, it's, I, think it's, I think it's very different. And so we haven't, we haven't decided what to do in that case. So that middle case is, is much grayer. Um, in particular, because of the way that our cats are created by by um, by introducing layers of uh, of you know these different components that are layered together algorithmically, you can imagine buying a very small number of cats on the order of you know 200 or so, and ending up owning all of the different traits, and then suddenly you're in that position again where you if we're giving you a blanket license to do whatever you want with derivative works, and you buy one example of every single trait, then can you recreate Crypto Kitties on another network and compete with us using our own art, and that's that's not a position we want to be in either. I just want to take a soft break. It is one o'clock. Um, we're going to stay and take questions for another fifteen minutes or so. But if anyone has to leave, thank you. Hi, um, I'm an old guy, so my first. My first leap of faith is taking you guys seriously, <laughs> um, but I'll, I'll do that. Um, I've, I've got two questions. One, can you give me a sense of the magnitude of the game, how many users, how much money is involved, et cetera? There's been, so, there's been nothing quantitative in this, so I've got no real sense of how seriously to take you. But the, my second question, which I think is a very serious one, is that you said two things that are contradictory, and I think untrue. Um, first, you talked about how you have visibility outside your own game because of the nature of the blockchain, um, and that's unique. Um, and two, you talked about civil attacks, which you know, says you don't actually have all that much visibility outside your, you know, outside your game because otherwise you would know that it was a civil attack. Um, you know, in the real world, um, there are all sorts of um, uncorrelated activities, and that has been seen as a business opportunity to create data brokers um, who then correlate all this stuff for you. Um, do you see, I mean, you, you seem to sort of be inviting, you know, a whole data broker level to, you know, integrate actions, um, you know, across the Ethereum blockchain so that you have, you know, visibility into this. Do you see that happening? And if you do, how does that change your 
um, view of privacy? Um, so just the, the contradiction is, is not a contradiction, it's just different users, right? So some users take steps to use different addresses in different contexts, and therefore we have no way of knowing that those are the same user. And so in that case, we don't have the visibility that I was talking about having. Other users don't take any steps, and then we have absolute visibility into everything they're doing. So any address that, that uses our smart contract, we can see all the other activity that address is doing. Some users use a single address for everything. Some users that use a bunch of different addresses. Um, the, the notion of data brokers and, and finding correlations, and you know, the, you know, famously the US government has done this as well, where they, they do analysis of blockchains to say, oh, well, these two addresses are actually clearly controlled by the same person or highly probable that they're controlled by the same people. And if you do that, and, uh, you, know, you can chain things together and, and start to make some um, some some suppositions about uh, about that break down some of that that pseudonymity protection. Um, I, I have no doubt that people will do that in a commercial context as well. It's not something that we're looking into or that we're that we're especially interested in. Um, you know this this idea that we're looking that we can look at all of our other user data. We're not right. So that, that's just saying that, that that's a possibility and it's it's interesting to think about that. Um, the, uh, what was the first part of your question again? The first part uh, was just understanding the game and, and kind of where we've shaken out. Uh, oh, the metrics. Yeah. yeah. So I haven't calculated that recently, but I think plus or minus GMV of $50 million. Is that about right? Um, it seems a little high, but. GMV. Just the size of the economy. That, that, like if somebody bought or sold a cat, basically. Um, but uh, I need to check yes, that. No. And then where are tens of thousands of users? Ballpark? Yeah. So we, when we broke Ethereum, we had fewer than 50,000 users. So the Ethereum network is very slow. <laughs> so the, the user numbers are very small. The amount of economic activity, um, like it, most of that economic activity doesn't come our way. Most of the economic activity is between users. Um, and, but yeah, I think, I think Alex is right. It's somewhere around uh, $15 million has changed hands uh, with regards to CryptoKitties. Um, building on that, could you say a little bit more about your business model? What, what do you guys own and how do you make money uh, in, in this ecosystem? Well, we sell the Gen Zero cats. That's our primary way of making money. We also provide um, uh, auction contracts that allow users to sell their cats or put their cats up for, um, for siring services and get paid for, for that. They're, there's nothing keeping people from using other means of auctioning off their cats, especially for sales. Uh, for siring, it would be a little bit more complicated, but it, it's, it's plausible as well. Um, the, but most people just use ours because it's hooked into our front end, and we, we get a 3.75% commission on that. So any sale that goes through, we just, we just don't pass through um, that 3.75% and it accumulates in our contract and we drain it out. So that's the two, that's the two ways that we make, make money directly. Thank you. On the topic of privacy, some of the transparency that you have for certain users goes both ways. People can also see who's using which contracts. They can see what additions you make to the chain as soon as they happen. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of my favorite stories is that when the Gen Zero kitties for a brief time stopped being produced one evening, right. someone noticed that the wallet that was paying yeah. for the gas to birth the kitties was empty, and they just they put money to yes, the wallet. Yes, they did. Yes, they did. So uh, we have to pay transaction fees, too, of course, because it's not our network. And uh, the, yeah, the account that pays the transaction fees for releasing new cats was drained. And one of our community members, because it was middle of the night, our time, uh, one of our community members in a different time zone noticed and uh, was, was kind enough to give us a, a, a short-term loan. <laughs> Uh, so we we, uh, we reimburse them the next day, but yeah, that's true. Uh, the, and that's you know you talk about metrics. Um, I mean we don't have the numbers on the tip of our tongues, but every single dollar we've made is recorded in the blockchain, and so you could compute our revenue to the penny if you wanted to. Um, so, or to the ninth ether decimal place. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Thirty to forty Ethereum. So just these are not them, but actually essentially participants in this economy who are providing services for fees 
in the broader infrastructure and that you know we have pseudonymity so these are ethereum accounts that represent the agents in the economic network who have chosen to participate in this way and you know the scale of 30 plus ethereum for those addresses means that these are serious businesses being executed by a combination of smart contracts and sort of bots that make the calls through those smart contracts because the contracts themselves are passive. I'm wondering, do you have any mechanism to back out of a fraudulent transaction or a mistaken transaction? So if you had something like the Bangladeshi break-in in the SWIFT system, that's done and there, there, there's no protection against that? Yeah, that's absolutely correct. So um, the nature of the blockchain is that it, it inherently doesn't have any mechanisms for that. Um, you can build those mechanisms on top as smart contracts. So you could very easily build, uh, we could have designed CryptoKitty such that transactions would be reversible for a certain period of time and you know keep the cat and the money in some kind of escrow uh, so that they couldn't be so that nothing could happen to them during that time and um, that just adds more complexity which adds more gas which is the way by which transaction fees are computed and make everything more expensive um, and so it would make you know 100 percent of the transactions more expensive for the you know less than one percent of the ones that might want to be reversed so um, Again, that's one of the reasons why starting with a game is great because um, you know people are a little bit more, um, a, a little bit less upset about making mistakes in a game and, and having that impact them than they would be with like say a life insurance policy. Um, but uh, it, it is, I think it's a, I think it's a flaw in blockchains. It's also a strength of blockchains because as a seller, you never have to worry about. Uh, uh, about chargebacks. So one of the questions we've asked ourselves is, well, shouldn't people just be able to come and buy the Gen U Zero cats that we're selling? Why can't we sell them that with just a credit card? Well, and the answer is, is that we would just be the victims of massive fraud. People would 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 either use stolen credit cards or they would use their own credit card and do a chargeback. And because we have no way of reversing uh, the the crypto transaction, then um, they would they would have this valuable asset and we would have nothing and so um, it is it is difficult to to bridge those two worlds because one world is the the implicit belief is is that you can reverse things and in the other world it, it really isn't. Can I ask one more question? I, I'm still a little confused about which parts of things are confidential or encrypted and which parts are open. Do you, suppo uh, supposing someone wanted to keep his, the genome of his cat secret, is he responsible for encrypting it? Do you provide some support for doing that? So there's no, there's no hidden information on the blockchain. Um, so people often think the blockchain is like this, this massive, like, secure place that you can put data and no one will see it. Uh, the, the opposite is true. All the data on there is 100% is visible. The reason why the blockchain provides uh, any kind of uh, privacy is because of the, the cheapness of creating additional addresses and creating multiple uh, identities. And um, if you're careful, it's difficult to, to tie those identities together um, and to know that those, the two activities are being done by the same person. But in terms of things like, like hiding the existence of or the, the data of a cat, that's, that's completely impossible. All of that data is completely 100% open and, and replicate on every single one of the Ethereum nodes, of which there are thousands. So once someone makes his, the genome of his cat available to one person, it's available to everyone on the blockchain? Yeah, so the, the, it's the smart contract that mediates the creation of new cats. There is no way to create a cat other than through the smart contract. Um, and the data that represents the cat is stored inside that smart contract and that is entirely visible to, to anyone. Well, I think we have to wrap it at this. Uh, just a final question. I know that Axiom Zen has done some nice explorations into AR and VR. Is there any hope that we might have uh, CryptoKitty Go? <laughs> well, I mean, we've talked about that since before we launched. Um, and at the uh, at the end of the day, it's a cool toy, but we just have so many ways to improve the product that make the core experience better right now that we just have to focus on those.
Sorry. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for coming.